I want to take a moment and thank you guys for coming out. And uh, also I want to take a moment and thank the specialist team back there, the publishers, it's Chuck, Patrick, and David. Raise your hands, guys. Those guys are responsible for putting the magazine out, and they do a phenomenal job. This is Brennan Casey. He's also one of the writers, and also uh, Mr. Matt Breyer is here with us. So what we're going to do is uh, just chat about some of the upcoming trends that we're seeing coming up in the industry, and this is going to maybe touch on some material stuff, and it's also going to touch on business, running your actual business. So uh, with that, I'm going to let Brendan start it off. Hi, I'm Brendan Dorn. I'm Brendan Casey with Casey Fence and Deck, a small family company located about an hour and a half west of here. Uh, we basically do little higher-end style custom deck building, uh, just creating a, a, filling a niche where most people around us are production builders, and there's a more of a demand for nicer projects. So we kind of focus on the details uh, to make a deck nicer than what people think they can have. And, and that's kind of been our thing, and it works really well for us. Hey guys, Matt Breyer here, uh, current president of Nadra, as well as uh, uh, owner of a residential remodeling company, focus on outdoor living, design, build, custom decks. Most of our projects are deck centric, so we're doing things in the backyard where there might be a sunroom, a patio, a closure, a uh, pergola, but most of our projects have decks, and we've been doing that for about 17 years. And once again, I'm David Ellenbaum. I actually own a store in South Carolina where we ship out and sell uh, deck material. So I don't build decks any longer, I used to. Uh, but don't do it any longer. So uh, if you have questions about materials or anything, I'm your guy. Uh, I'm going to start out by making my big point for the day. And what I want to talk about is having a contracting business and having a successful one and keeping it that way. And one of the things I like to, to pay attention to is how the business is running for each person. So last year you maybe you built 10 decks, this year you're going to build 20, next year you want to build 30. And how are you going to grow your business to accommodate that? And, and so the big point I want to make today is being very cautious about that. So I was a, a contractor back in 2006. And our concept was, let's sell as much as we can. Let's add people. Let's, let's hire some project managers. Let's buy some trucks. And let's see if we can keep this going. Let's get this sucker to four million and five and keep going. And guess what happened? So if you notice right now, the economy's cranking and everybody's got more work they can handle. Anybody here can build a deck next week? Can anybody build a deck next week? No. You're selling out to when? Next spring, right? Anybody book till June? So at this time, this is when a contractor says, hey, I gotta hire some more people. I'm gonna get some trucks. I'm gonna hire a project manager. I'm going to do all these different things to help grow my business. But then if things slow down, you've got to now meet this new, this new point of sales in order to make your company work. So the other thing you hear about is when the economy's bad, that's the time to invest, right? So that's counterproductive to what, what I'm talking about. So right now, I want to caution you, right now is not the time to invest in trying to grow your business beyond the point that you're at right now. Right now is the time to try to squeeze more points out of the revenue that you're generating right now. So if you're doing a million bucks a year and your profit margin after everything is said and done is 6% or 7% or whatever it is, now is the time to get that number up, not try to get your sales revenue going up. So think about that with your business. One of the things for us is uh, finding a niche. Uh, we're doing a lot more curved decks these days. Uh, not a lot of companies in our area do that. A lot of guys are afraid to do it or just don't have the wherewithal. So we invested in the, the proper equipment, modified it to suit our needs, and did a lot of training with our guys in order to be able to do it and do it profitably. Because a lot of times when you do that stuff, it's not profitable or you price yourself out of being able to do it. So by having the, the right equipment and the right employees uh, and, and the right knowledge, it, it's made it a lot easier to do that job right. And, and it creates a lot more projects for us because now people are seeking us out to do those types of jobs. I'm going to uh, play off of what David was saying a little bit. There's, there's a point as you're looking at growing your company and hiring new people. 
increasing that overhead uh, requirement of keeping those satisfied employees. And we all know it's a tougher labor market out there. It's not like we've got you know 20 experienced carpenters just standing at the door waiting for us to hire them. A lot of times you've got a, a lot of effort into taking someone that's not from the industry or they've got really bad baggage or bad habits and trying to mold them and bring them in. And as you're as you're doing that, that means you have to absorb all of that lost potential revenue and all of those direct costs to bring them on board and try and get them ramped up, which like Dave was saying, is that just works against your, your, your uh, net profitability. Something I'm seeing kind of on the horizon as I'm trying to get a feel for where is this uh, industry and where is it going, where does it need to go, is what some of the other building industry uh, components have been doing, and that's moving from a very uh, rudimentary, you know, pile of stuff shows up in the driveway, pile of guys pull out of a you know, pickup truck and start building it, into a little bit more of a systematized process where perhaps there's some components that are pre-built, uh, perhaps there's some uh, uh, panelized systems, maybe there's some something that's done in a way that streamlines the amount of labor that is needed to produce a really quality finished project and reduce some of those variables as well. Uh, we've seen that in our industry probably most readily when it comes to railings, when you can get you know pre-configured railing systems that are on a pallet and just lift them up, slide them into place, you know, four screws later you're done. But I think we're gonna see that continue to grow because we aren't gonna just suddenly overnight have all those perfect carpenters we need. And if we're going to look at increasing our profitability, we've got to go in other directions. And it doesn't mean necessarily it's just a new product, because everyone else is going to find that product too. So it's those internal systems, and I think we're going to see more of that yeah, pre-manufactured components, and that's going to be a that's going to be a, a, a cool thing to keep your eye out for. I'd like just to expand on what he just said. One of the things that we found a lot is you walk around this building today. Uh, you can probably find at least a hundred or more different railing manufacturers, and they're all great. Uh, one of the things you want to do is find your go-to railing system, something that your crews can do productively, but it's also going to look really well on your job. Uh, we use a, a system from a local manufacturer that my guys can take out of the box, cut, assemble, and have it installed in under 10 minutes. So we're not wasting a lot of time. Uh, figuring out one to the other. Yes, if somebody wants us to do a different railing, we will, but from the beginning, we're going to offer the railing that we know we can be very productive at installing, uh, and that way our jobs are going to move along quicker, and they're going to have a more uniform look to it. So we've modified it, created our own style. Uh, it sets us apart from everybody else in our area, but we're also really quick at putting it in, uh, which obviously increases your profitability. That's a, that's a great point, too, because if you're building essentially the same deck over and over and over again, and I don't mean that they're all the same color with the same black rail with the same, but, you, you know, this one's a 16 by 20 and this one's a, you know, 17 by 35 with a, with a curve on it, whatever, the materials you're using are generally the same thing. So when you go to the house and sell the deck, the people say, well, what do you like to use? I mean, that's a common question that a contractor's asked. And a lot of contractors will go back and say, well, I don't know, I'll use whatever you want. Pick something out and I'll put it in. I'm a craftsman. Okay, but, okay, right now we got to switch over to be a business person. Okay, I use this, 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 and this. And here's why. And it all comes down to the time, the efficiency of installing that product, knowing everything there is to know about that product. It makes you better at selling it, and it makes you better at installing it. And the best thing, the reason we're all here, is it improves, improves your project, or your profitability. So, good point, thank you. Yeah, speaking to that as well, we've done that with our railings. Probably half of our projects have the same basic railing, but we have a couple of variations that we'll do with it. So it doesn't change the, the cost substantially, and it doesn't change the installation time. So our crews, once they're trained, they can do it, and they can do it very well. But uh, we knew we had a, a winning product there, and that's something that we've used as a competitive advantage in our marketplace. It's just because we know we're very, very good at that line item, and we don't have to chase the installation instructions and the different brackets for a bunch of different things. We've, we've limited that. I mean, I'm a guy with a couple thousand square foot of leftover boards and stuff in storage. 
Um, you know, because you, you buy it and you're like, oh, man, that's an expensive board. I'm going to need that for the next job. And by the time you actually get to that next job, you've moved that board like 16 times in your shop and it's scratched and you can't use it anyway. So the, the more you can streamline what you use, what you go for, what you, what you grab, and yet still not lose the creativity, you know, because that's what's going to set you apart as well. You don't just want to force a single product you got to give almost the illusion of choice without giving too many choices. Just a lot of clients will get overwhelmed with that too. If you if you show them you know 60 different deck boards, and 14 railing styles, on three different designs, uh, it's too much. It's just too much for them to take in. So Brennan, you were making a great point earlier. We were chatting before we started here, and you made a point about the size of decks. So if you, I'd love you to explain that again about what you're seeing from the deck sizes that you guys are putting in. Well, for us. We've seen a big trend of larger decks. Our average job this year is at least 400 square feet, um, doing a lot more 800 and 1,000 square feet jobs. Uh, I think because of the uh, ability to show people nicer things and having nicer projects and more larger projects on our website, people are now seeking us out for those jobs. So uh, you go on a lot of sites and guys will have one nice deck, or one big deck on their site. They don't have 20 or 30 or 40 of them, but this, the consumer sees that. They know that they're not going to be your first really custom job or your, their first big job. So you want to, you want once you build those, you really want to be able to display them and get them out in front of people so that they will come seek you out uh, and do those larger jobs. Because for us, I don't want to go build a 20 by 12 every day. I mean, at the time it costs to pack up a job site and move to the next job site and then get started and try to work uh, is a lot of downtime, a lot of wasted time. So we try to keep ourselves within 25 to 50 miles of our office and, and focus on those larger jobs. And I think while the economy is in the condition that it's in and everybody's got more, more money to spend on nicer projects, they want the, the larger stuff. They want that living space or that, that addition to their home because people are going to stay and use it. They're investing in their lifestyle, and, and they want that larger area to do it on and entertain and, and have their friends. So it just takes a little bit of extra creativity to, to come up with the ideas, listen to what they want, uh, and then give them what they want. And um, with the larger decks, that's a big thing for us now is that just – we're seeing that trend of larger projects. More and more people want to buy a, a larger deck on their house. Uh, hopefully that's more of you guys out here are seeing that too. Well, we've, we've been using uh, 3D design software for years and that's helped us to grow the average size of the deck and also some of the details, the extras, the add-ons and options. Uh, not every homeowner can look at a set of plans and visualize what it's going to look, at, look like. And a lot of them have gone through uh, Pinterest or House or something, and they've got some concepts of styles they like, but they don't really know how that relates to what they have in terms of physical constraints of the house or their their needs, their budget. And when we're able to take the precise measurements, put it together in one of our different design programs and show them here's what it could look like, it starts to make it real and make it personal for them. So now they're looking not just at a generic size compared to six other estimates of generic size, they're starting to look at a custom design project that reflects, if, if we're good, that we will have listened during those early meetings and we understand where their priorities are, what their, their style preferences are, and we're able to reflect that and then gently kind of parrot that back to them as we're talking to say, hey, you mentioned this, you mentioned you want to have large gatherings, you wanted to have that, that intimate space over here, you, you wanted to make sure that there was room around the fire pit but it was safe. Those types of things, if it's important and we can show it off to them and then we try and augment it with past project pictures, but we found there's a lot of clients that they look at a picture and they can't, even if it's the exact same model house in the same neighborhood built by the same builder and we're looking at the same thing, they can't picture it as their own. And so silly as having a 3D design where I can change the siding color to match their house. And all of a sudden it clicks and they're like, oh, that totally fits. And then they're a client and then they're happy. It's huge. Yeah, owning a, a, a store where we sell decking material, the bar napkin is amazing. The, the, I have contractors and customers that come in there with, with a sketch that has you know three lines and three dimensions on it. And I start asking questions. They want me to do the takeoff for them. Okay? This, so I start asking questions. How high off the ground is it? Uh, uh, the, the, you know, they don't about know. And there's no, yeah, it's about this much. And I think it's going to be about nine steps. You know, 
going into the quote, I've, I've always said you can sell half the decks you quote if you just show up and you have a pulse. It's true, because people don't show up to give estimates. Homeowners call five or six contractors and two show up. If you're one of them, you got a 50-50 shot at getting the deck. Okay, now we're beyond that. Everybody here knows how to sell a project and show up and give an estimate for in their own way. You know, some guys will take and uh, you know I think the materials are going to be three thousand, so the deck's six. But however you get there, if you sell the job, that's great. You want to make more money selling decks and installing decks. You're going to do what he's talking about. You're going to have design software. You're going to do what he's talking about, which you're going to know what the materials are that you're going to use, the ones that you can bang out and put them in as fast as you can. Because this isn't a deck took me six weeks and I made X amount of dollars on it. This is a how much do I make every day that my crew is on the job site every single day. Okay, how much do we lose when it rains? How much do we make when we switch over to this product? How much do we lose when we go and uh, let somebody self-design their own project? Okay, so... Those are the things that if you want to be a successful contractor, build decks and make money, those are the things you start thinking about. Every screw, every nail, every board, every, every little thing matters. One other thing I'd like to add about the materials that you're using and everything is in designing. Um, a lot of people are just so used to that rectangular box on the back of their house that they could have gone to the hardware store, got three guys out of the parking lot and built for them. And that's not why any of us are here. We're all trying to make ourselves better. So one of the things that we like to do, and more guys in my area are starting to do, things like adding picture frame borders. A lot of guys will be afraid to add that border. They think there's a lot of extra work involved in it. Uh, when you're laying straight decking, you put a picture frame border, two boards out the front of the deck, two boards at the house, you are already putting the boards there anyway. So don't be afraid to uh, change and, and add that contrasting color and that extra little detail. It doesn't really take that much extra time, but it allows you to offer your client a feature that, it, unfortunately, today they're probably getting five other bids on, uh, and you want to differentiate yourself. You don't want to be the get the job because you were the cheapest one. You want to get the job because you were the, the best one or the most qualified one to get the project. Uh, and, and so you want to be able to offer them a, a detail that the next guy didn't offer them. So don't be afraid to look at that kind of stuff and, and try it. It might take you a job or two to, to uh, get, it, get it down uh, to be productive. But once you do, like my guys, if we're not putting a border in, they're asking me, why not? This deck should have a border. So we're, we're at a point now where every deck we build has at least a single picture frame border or a double picture frame border. Uh, we don't put a butt joint in the deck. We create a transition into the middle of the deck. It's a small little detail that really doesn't take any extra time. It probably takes you more time to uh, figure out your pattern of butt joints than it did to lay a transition board up the middle of the deck and, and just cut straight decking around it. So again, look at those options and, and see different ideas to differentiate yourself from the next guy. So I'm going to offer an alternative perspective on that, uh, just because because <laughs> I learned this lesson the, the painful way. All right, so when we were back in the recession and everything was just collapsing around us, that's when we got really serious as a company about figuring out who we were, how we were going to present that image to the marketplace, and uh, have a long-term marketing plan and, and advertising. And something we learned was at that time, we had several things built in. This is how we do it. Uh, for instance, we used a very nice composite railing system, and that's what we used because it was the best on the market, and that's what we used. And we always did fascia on our decks. It was just, these are things that we felt it should be done, have a quality project. And what we came to realize was we're a value-oriented marketplace, my company is, and a lot of our clients were still at that basic pressure-treated deck nailed together with the cheapest, you know, um, deck boards used as railing components and stuff, and it was just so far down that list of shoddy construction that we couldn't do that. And so if they're looking at a $4,000 budget and I'm at $9,000, they can't compute the difference between what they think they should be spending and what I'm trying to force them to spend. So that's what got, got us to having to be creative and realizing to, to do a better job of reading our clients or our prospective clients at that point, to know if we could open their eyes to why it was valuable to have that board, why it made sense to have a, a fascia or a better railing system or ways that we could improve the design so they got more bang for their buck there. 
or if on the other side, they did have that tight budget and they didn't have the ability to spend for those frills, but they wanted quality and we could find a way to say, how can we streamline this project and cut every little line item out without compromising on the structural integrity or the long-term performance and just give them something that's very basic. And at the end of the day, if you can do that with uh, grace and respect to where they don't feel like you're looking down on them because they can't afford it. We, we've had some clients that bought that starter deck for their starter home and then four or five years later came back on that next house and now they can afford it and we've built that relationship and, and again, I'm using generic numbers, but you know, it was a stretch for that $4,000 project, and now they're happy, like, we got 25 grand, whatever you want to do, you know, and it's, it's great, you know, because you're making their dreams come to, come to life. That's great. How much time we got, guys? Five minutes. <laughs> Ten. Okay. Does anybody here have a question that we can touch on? Sir. I, I didn't push it, I'll say that. They, they asked for it. Um, it was kind of a, a funny situation where they'd already had a bunch of estimates, uh, weren't happy with the people. They decided for a year to put the project on hold. They had a bunch of funky angles on the back of their house. Um, they asked me what I would do, and, and I was standing there, and all of a sudden I just kind of started walking across the yard, and, a, like, and sir, I said, I don't want to follow all these angles. So I just softened it by creating a curve, and we actually curved it, and then where, where it came back, we kind of almost reversed it like a wave, and, and it kind of it turned out neat looking. Um, they wanted it to go across the house, so we talked them out of going almost 24 feet away from the house and, and keeping it at 12 to 16 feet and taking that same square footage and stretching it across the back of the house so it fit the footprint of the house a lot nicer. We did not curve the railings. We just shortened up our rail sections and kind of walked them around the curve. Uh, now, I will say something really unique on that was we used six by six white vinyl sleeves um, and a full width deck board rail cap. So we did heat form and curve a picture frame border around the deck and then match that with the uh, rail cap so it really looked nice and then put lighting on that. So we basically, again, used our basic uh, vinyl rail system that is kind of our go-to, but we generally use a uh, black round baluster, and we always, kind of a signature for us is the six by six sleeve and a steel post inside. We love the steel post because I can take a wire and run it up that hollow steel and I don't have to chamfer off an edge of my post or worry about bolts and things like that getting in the way. And if I ever have to replace a light, it's very simple for me to just, we zip tie the top of the wire at the top of the post. So if we have to get back in there, it's, it's, it's easy. So um, on that big deck, the railings were, were pretty simple to do. It worked out nice. So I got a question. How much money did you make on that one? The curved decks. The, most, yeah, most, most, most of the time when you're going to try something new like curve and decking in your business, just plan not to make any money on that. doesn't matter how much you charge. You charge twice as much for the whole project, you're still not going to make any money. But it, you have to look at new things like that as an investment in the future. So you got to make sure that you learn from it. Yeah, and that's why you don't do a learning project every single time. You kind of got to space those out just a little bit, um, unless you're independently wealthy and you really, really like learning things the painful way. Anybody else have a question? Sir. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so he's asking if we take into consideration the waste of material in, in curving a deck. We definitely take that into consideration. We order a couple extras. We, we do actually now, we've got it down where we're pretty good at not ruining a board. Uh, we try to lay it out so that uh, any time there's a splice, it's under a post. So by having that uh, six by six sleeve with the big skirt around it, it also takes up a good bit of that splice and it's good hiding place for, for that splice. Um, 
we don't, like I said, we really don't have a whole lot of waste on it now because of that. Uh, we, and we do try, we always try to just design it with the, the idea of not having waste. Uh, even our board patterns, every board pattern that we ever come up with on a deck, it, it's based on not wasting material. They, they're, they're more functional. So um, my guys, when we did that deck, we, we did waste one board. Because we, had, it was the first time we used the equipment. We kind of invented our own. We bought the, the those heat con pads and the insulation. We built our own oven. So we built, took box wood and built a box for it and and had it out. So we did it right in place on the job. We didn't mold them in a shop and come back out. We framed our deck 12 inch on center and we, we heated them up and tacked them into place, let them cool overnight because it was a big job. Uh, and then following morning, we just went back out and moved everything and made our cuts then. So we didn't have to worry about the, the shrinkage around the cuts either. Anybody else, another question? No? Matt, do you want to touch on anything else? No, it's it's we we did curved decks back before the recession, and then our marketplace never got to the point where it's been a strong selling point. Um, so back when we did curved uh, boards, we built an oven. I don't think the blankets were fully on the market yet, so we built a huge oven using a corrugated uh, pipe. We had uh, heat blowers in there, and we toasted off. I want to say it was five out of six boards to get one good one because it was so inconsistent in the heating. You'd end up baking different parts of the boards as it hit its, its flash point. Uh, it was it was expensive. So I I have I have bad props for being able to figure it out that well. Apparently I learn a little bit slower. So I've been a big fan of the uh, early curve decks of the guy with the, the skill saw and the, and the slot every. You know, three quarters of an inch all the way down the board to be able to get it to curve. That's and, dedication. And, I, and I'll tell you, we did it too. Because we didn't know any better. And then we started figuring out how to actually laminate plywood and make laminated beams for curving. And it, you know, it makes it quicker and easier. You, you do one, you stumble. You do the second one, you stumble. The third one, you start to kind of figure it out. And then from then on, it, it gets pretty sweet. And then before you know it, you're charging 25, 30 bucks a foot for a curved edge, and then you're charging another 25 to 30 bucks for curving the rail, and it sits on top of it. So your, your profitability on that deck goes through the roof if you're good at it. If you're not good at it, don't do it. Period. We're big on making jigs. So, like for our curved deck, once we laid it all out, uh, my guy, great guy, I, I, he's probably walking around here somewhere. He, he created his own jig for cutting it. So we, we were able to roll a, the jig around the frame of the deck so the, the board ends were cut exactly the same width everywhere, going all the way around. So really, this, the curve was there. We put a lot of blocking in so that when we laid the boards down, we didn't have to wait. We could just lay them in there. We're not worried about any sagging between the joists or anything. So it all worked out nice. And we do jigs for a lot of different things because that also helps. If you've done it once, you're probably going to do it again. So you might as well make a jig for it so that you're not wasting time. Two more. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else have a question? You have to use hot dip Okay, the question is, can I recommend 3D software? And kind of. <laughs> so we use, uh, I think, four different types of software right now. And there's nothing perfect on the marketplace. The best you'll find, from, from my humble perspective, is Structure Studios. Um, it's incredible. It's very in-depth. The photorealism, the graphics engine they use to drive it is just stunning. And they've now got augmented reality where you can draw on an iPad, show it to someone as you pan and they look, they can see what you've just designed uh, superimposed over top of their actual like, legit space. It looks amazing. Your downside there is it's a slower program to use because it is so accurate in all of the all of the details. So if you need to crank out a design in 30 minutes to an hour and a half, usually you can't use that software. But if you have a, a couple of days to invest and the client has that financial capability to, to pay for it, you need to show them that, it's probably your best solution in the marketplace. We've used SketchUp before, uh, a couple of different versions of deck tools, VisionScape when it was still available in the marketplace. Um, 
I'm missing one. Do it real time. Yeah, uh, RLA is a good one. That's probably your best go-to for uh, real, land, uh, real landscape real architecture. Yeah. It's probably your best go-to right now for it. Looks kind of realistic. It looks. It, it's still, again, from my perspective, kind of uh, cartoonish in its in its rendering. But you have the ability to, to show some angles, uh, adjust your elevations pretty quickly, you can draw quickly. And to me, that's part of it. I've got to have a software solution that I'm comfortable enough with that I might do that first design and hand it off to them and say, hey, what do you all think of this? Do you like it? And if they say yes, chances are good. I'm going to be back in front of, the, in front of them, sitting at their house, tweaking it with them looking over my shoulder. So I've got to be comfortable enough with that software that I can manipulate it and show them those different things without it crashing, without taking too much time, and without, you know, getting, you know, hyperventilating because it's, you know, it's, it's so slow. So it's a, it's a balancing act. And everyone's personal preferences. Actually charts. Don't go grab the fancy software solution that overwhelms you. If all you need is a simple solution, and then make sure you're comfortable with it. You know, over the 20 years, we've seen a lot of different things come out, and a lot of a lot of software where it tries to do everything. It's literally trying to do your job for you because you're going to design something, and you want it to tell you how much to charge for it. You want it to tell you how many two by tens you need, and you want it to kick out all these drawings and things like that. What I found out after all the decks I sold, all I really needed was a 3D visualizer. Something to just make it, hey, this is what it's going to look like. That's it. That's all I needed. I, don't, I know how to do a takeoff. I don't need something that's going to tell me how many joist hangers to buy. I need a visualizer to help the person that I'm talking to figure out if that's the deck that they want and the colors. So real-time landscape architects is the one that I use, and I could do a deck design at their house in five or ten minutes, showing them what it's going to look like, and sell the job. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, who cares how good the design is if they don't buy? You know, we, it's, 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 it's a reality. You've got to be able to close that sale. And sometimes the fancier solution and prettier picture, if it takes an extra day, that could be a couple extra missed prospects you, you didn't get a chance to meet with. And speaking of closing, we got to close this session. So we really appreciate everybody coming out and listening to us. I'm going to hang around for a few minutes if you got any questions for me, and I'm sure these guys will do the same. So thanks so much for coming. And uh, Thanks, make guys. sure to read Deck Specialist.